Hey, Hillside. Um, well, this week I read about the rather unorthodox, uh, orthodox nun, um, Saint Maria of Paris. Uh, Saint Maria was not your typical nun, <laughs> so uh, get ready for that. So she was born in 1891 in Latvia um, from in a well-to-do family of the Ukrainian aristocracy, and they were devout Orthodox Christians. Um, and as a young child at seven, she asked her mom to join a convent. Uh, at eight, she asked if she could journey with religious pilgrims and um, even gave every bit of her savings, young savings, to uh, a for a mural of a, her patron saint in a new local church. Um, so that was like characterized her young life. Um, but they, her family moved to an estate in Russia and um, were there until she was 13 when her father died. And this um, really, when this happened, um, it really affected her and she decided that she could no longer believe in God um, and declared herself an atheist. Um, and so for the next um, several or next, you know, years in, into young adulthood, that's how she lived. And they um, moved to St. Petersburg, Russia. And that was really the first time she saw poor and uneducated people, um, which also started a lifelong passion to help these people. And this was all during the time um, of the, the rise of Bolshevism. So she had some interesting political um, affiliations and falling ins and things um, and became a, a poet uh, in St. Petersburg and really ran in the same circles as the literary elite there. Um, but she saw, a, she had a problem with the church um, apart from just being kind of angry at God for losing her father, but also just saw it as an institution bogged down by traditions, really just a cultural thing and thought that it was dead and useless. Um, but at the same time, um, that countered with her passion for the poor, um, which led her um, to become the first woman to attend the Ecclesiastical Academy and to study theology, and really brought her back to a real devotion to her faith. Um, um, but she still had the prop this problem with the church as being a dead thing, and... Um, and knew to her that serving God meant serving people. And of these people, she said, I know their only need is Jesus. And so at first, um, she did this, serving people um, apart, really, from the church. From um, She still had her faith, but apart from the church. And um, became the mayor of her town, got in politics, to protect her people from the turmoil of the rising revolution. Um, had some interesting run-ins, um, which you can read about with both the Bolsheviks and the anti-Bolshevik White Party. Um, but when the Bolsheviks gained more power and control, um, she was forced to leave and moved around as refugees, and they ended up in Paris in 1923. Um, a couple years later, her four-year-old daughter died of influenza um, after they'd just suffered from poverty and malnutrition. And that experience really solidified this calling on her life to ministry among the poor and the outcast um, Russian immigrant population. So she shifted and started writing about ministry and theology and started traveling with a ministry as a speaker. But her plans changed when she was faced with the, the immediate needs of the people that she was supposed to talk to. And one example they gave was um, she was supposed to give a talk to some miners, um, not miners, young miners like in a mine, you know, mining work, um, who they had horrible living conditions. And someone said that if she really wanted to help them, she would scrub the floors. And so she did just that. She got down and started scrubbing the floors. And that really is a great illustration of what the rest of her life and ministry would become. Um, her perspective on motherhood when she lost her daughter changed and she just had this desire to be a mother to the world. And I'm mean, the best way she knew to do that was um, a um, a, another influence in her life, um, religious leader told her to become a nun and she did not think she would be a good one. <laughs> and, um, so he said, yeah, probably not, but she could be a revolutionary nun. And, um, she really was not your typical nun. Like I said, she'd been married twice, twice divorced, had three children by two men, one of them out of wedlock. She smoked, she drank. Um, she turned a lot of eyes and got a lot of criticism as a nun. Um, and not only for those things, um, but also because most nuns lived uh, in, in within the walls of the monastery, really, and they were pretty removed from the world and just had this life of personal devotion or pietism and 
Um, and she was not about that, right? She, she had this desire. She thought that's dead and useless. She had this desire to be out in the world and serving people. And so she got an old dilapidated house and moved in a bunch of young out of work Russian women. Uh, she gave up her room even to, um, her bed for them, but stayed with them like on, in a cot and she fed them, she clothed them, she lived among them and as one of them. And um, she opened a larger home. She opened homes for men, homes for families, home for sick. Um, and this really was what she did with the rest of her life. And um, she would go days, uh, even without food or sleep, going out, um, seeking out to find homeless people and, um, and to invite them into these homes um, and to share a meal and, um, and just some time together and fellowship. And um, that's how she connected with people and ministered to them and changed their life. And um, a lot of people you know, criticized her of these things. And, um, and sh it, you know, it, you can even look at echo some of the criticisms thrown at Jesus for living among um, the, you know, why would you live among these people, these, you know, horrid people or whatever. Um, and so she said, um, as she guarded all this criticism from these practices, as opposed to the practices of the more ritualistic and religious life of other nuns, um, she said this, she said, at the last judgment, I shall not be asked whether I satisfactorily, fa satisfactorily practice asceticism, nor how many bows I have made before the divine altar. I will be asked whether I fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the sick, and the prisoner in his jail. That is all that will be asked. Um, and that really is a great um, explanation of why she did what she did and um, the way that she lived her life in ministry and then um, the Second World War broke out and Paris fell to the Germans and then she shifted to hiding countless Jews in her homes and um, transported as many as she could to safety um, uh, and she was eventually arrested by the Gestapo and spent two years at a Ravensbrück um, concentration camp and while she was there and you know horrid um, depressing situation. She organized prayer groups. She read from the Gospels and led discussions. And um, she was described in this place as being constantly upbeat and friendly. Um, can you imagine being in a concentration camp as a prisoner and being constantly upbeat and friendly? Um, she ended up dying in the camp on Easter weekend in 1945, um, Great and Holy Saturday, as the Orthodox Church calls it. And um, it wasn't until much later in 2004 that the Orthodox Church canonized her to sainthood. And um, a lot of that is because she, the life that she led wasn't your typical life of a nun, and um, a lot of people didn't like her for that, um, but rightly recognized for all that she did in 2004. And um, Metaxas described it, this probably a large reason why um, the, the Orthodox Church really didn't like her, because um, he describes her life as an indictment of any form of Christianity that seeks Christ chiefly inside the walls of our churches. Um, and I think that partially her life is um, uh, kind of not condemning the life, just uh, like an accountability check um, to uh, a lot of people who do live their lives inside the walls of the church. Um, and a lot of times, you know, sometimes we get caught up in that or the American church. There's a lot of American churches in which that is as well. The Christian life, um, they kind of, you know, the Christian bubble. Um, you live within the church and all your involvements are in the church and you're spending every day at church programs and um, all of these things when um, we're really called to go into the world and preach the gospel. And um, I was reminded of um, some of the foundational ver verses of Hillside, uh, Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people lay a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And how can they see um, your works and your light? And um, how can you let your light shine if you're closed up within the walls of your church all the time? And this isn't to say, obviously, the churches are um, good places, places where we go to fellowship and to build each other up and to prepare to go out then and be lights and to shine and to minister to people outside. And um, it's, you know, one of the things that I love about Hillside is uh, a desire to, yes, have things and have ministries for people here 
um, but to not get too bogged down and overprogrammed because we want to be that that the Monday morning church as um as we call it and um going out and like being and doing what Jesus would be being and doing if he were here. Um so um just offer some encouragement for that. Um and this you don't have to have the perfect, you know, cookie cutter. You don't have to be um you know, we're not without going to be without brokenness and sin like um St. Maria had this history and um, and still would, at, in her nun habit, be walking the farmer's market for buying uh, old produce for the people in her homes as she was smoking a cigarette going down. And so um, just this idea that um, you're not going to be this perfect, have it all together um, person, but you just go out and minister as you are. Just say what Jesus has done for you and what he can do for others and um, and just love them. So um, that is my message for you today, and we'll see you next time.